All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. I am not going to speak about aging. I'm here to sort of give you uh, my, think my view of uh, where we are with systems neuroscience and organization of the brain on a, on a large scale. Uh, and part of that is, say, is, is explaining how our view of the brain has changed over in the past couple decades. So what our lab does is we study executive brain functions, planning, focusing, attention, et cetera, and so forth. And we study them by recording electrical me, signals from the brains of non-human primates. We use computational modeling to make sense of these signals, and we want, because we want to understand cognition, it's dysfunction and diseases, um, such as autism, schizophrenia, ADHD. Now, in employing these studies, we began about 20 years ago or so to begin using new um, multiple electrode technology. And this is significant because in the 20th century, when I was a graduate student, we used to record activity, spiking activity from single neurons one at a time with a single electrode. That was due to a technological limitation. Also, we understood less about how the brain worked. We had to figure out the brain's parts. But in, in fact, in general, we kind of focused on the brain's parts, individual brain areas and the spiking of single neurons. And as a result, we thought the um, parts each had one function. And this is... Our, our view about this has changed. It's not completely untrue. The different parts of the brain are specialized for different things, but it's all relative specialization, there's, and there's much more complexity going on. So now we have the technology to record signals from hundreds of millions of neurons simultaneously. And this has begun to um, increase our understanding of the brain on a network level and its emergent properties. And these are properties and mechanisms that emerge. You only can see them when the parts interact as a wider whole. You can't see them one part at a time. And I'll show you an example of one of them in a minute. But we used to think about spikes. And think about spikes from single neurons. This is all we used to study one at a time. And these are like the individual voices of, of neurons in the brain. But now we're looking at additional signals to look at these emergent properties. And one is local field potentials, which is like the average activity of millions of neurons near the electrode, the roar of the local crowd, and even the level of um, electric field, the larger crowd. And I'm here to tell you that there's information relevant to function at every one of these levels. And I'll show you an example. But first, let me begin. How did the, uh, it's go back about 20 years, and we started a series of studies um, um, to explain how the brain, trying to explain how the brain learns abstract concepts or principles. We taught monkeys categories, shape categories like cats versus dogs. Or we taught them to recognize small numbers, one through five. And we taught them high-level abstract principles like same versus different and up versus down. And what we found is that the prefrontal cortex, your executive cortex in the front of your brain, seems to be the sponge that absorbs all this top-down information. And its neurons throw away the details that don't matter and just learns the task at the level of rules and principles, which is what you'd expect for goal-directed behavior. We went on to show how the prefrontal cortex could use top-down information to actually control the flow of activity across the rest of the cortex and produce top-down control. Now, we did these experiments, we found out something unusual. It seemed unusual a couple of decades ago. We used new multiple electro technology. Instead of studying maybe 50 or 60, a small sample of neurons one at a time, we began to study hundreds of neurons. So we got a better picture of what the population of neurons looked like. And what we found when we recorded in the prefrontal cortex and then subsequently other higher cortical areas, we found these effects, cat versus dog, numbers, up versus down, same versus different, in 30 to 40 percent of the neurons that we randomly selected. That's a lot of neurons. It's like, it's like the task took over the brain. And the problem with that at the time was that the 20th century paradigm said that every neuron should have one function. And neurons do their thing by combining, single function neurons combine their, uh, their um, signals by virtue of how they're wired together. And then we, you, know, you start with like small neurons in the back of the brain that, that deconstruct the visual field into small line segments. And you combine, 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 and eventually you get peace, love, and understanding. Now, this model didn't explain why we would see effects in 30 to 40% of the neurons. It predicts the opposite, a diverse set of specialized neurons with different functions. But what we found through many years of subsequent experiments, and is now widely assumed, I believe, is that cortical neurons don't have one function, especially in higher cortical areas. They are multifunctional, have a property called mixed selectivity. 
Now, what this mixed selectivity is, is the way, first of all, we used to think about the, the um, brain is that we thought neurons are relatively simple and specialized. They had one function only. They might detect single features like edges or simple, simple linear combinations of a few features that all piece together to something. So this example here is in neurons that, population neurons that combine, you know, color form and, and rolling into the percept of a rolling ball. It might combine a few features, but all the features make sense together. And in conducting these experiments uh, using these higher order principles we were teaching the animal, we found that uh, um, this property called mixed selectivity it did not fit this traditional mold. These neurons were selective for complex combinations of many features with no obvious re relationship. And if you study them on multiple tasks, you train the animal to do different tasks, you find the same neuron will have different functions, apparently unrelated functions, in different tasks. Now, these neurons weren't random. Every time you went back to the same task, the same context, the neuron did the same thing. It just seemed to do a bunch of really different things in different, different situations. Now, why are these mixed sectomy neurons so important for top-down, this high-level top-down information? Well, it's the final few see. Mati Rogati and Melissa Warden showed is that they provide computational horsepower to the brain. They're like a neural bazaar where a wide range of information can be combined. All this diverse information is combining this single population of networks of neurons, so, they, so the information, the brain has this information at its fingertips. This makes the brain smarter. Among other things, it provides a high dimensional representational space where neural representations get much more complicated, contain more information, so you can do more high level stuff with them. And also for, for mathy reasons I won't explain, it, it, um, it makes the brain go essentially capacity unlimited by, and it does this by distributing the information across many different neurons. So now the brain can store much more information. And all this mingled information means that the brain, you can learn things quickly and you have flexibility to change your mind from moment, moment to moment. However, the problem is um, with mixed selectivity. So mixed selectivity is now, now I, we're see, it's, I think it's widely accepted. You, people are reporting it all over the brain, places like even not just cortex, olfactory bulb has mixed selectivity. Uh, but the problem is mixed selectivity requires a new way of thinking about the brain. We used to think Every neuron had one function. And we used to think that anatomy is destiny. Neurons combine their signals because they're wired together. So the idea was that every perception, every thought, every action, everything your brain does has a, an anatomically unique network, an ensemble. So I have two networks here. Here's the blue thought and the red thought. And the blue thought has one network. The red thought has another network. And so does every other thought you might have. But the problem is mixed selectivity means that neurons are not members of individual networks, individual ensembles. They're members of multiple networks. So if, so that's what I've illustrated here. We have our, now I combine our red and blue into, into one overlapping, anatomically overlapping network. And now sharing common elements of these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons. But if anatomy is destiny, how does this work? Why don't all the networks just activate one another and create a jumble of thoughts, right? I mean, if I want to think the red thought here, if I try to activate a red neuron, activity will travel to other red neurons and go through the mixed selectivity, multifunctional neurons, and now we activate the blue network, right? So how does your brain select individual ensembles from this overlapping anatomy with these neurons that share common elements among different ensembles. And this is just two ensembles. Your brain may have like hundreds of uh, neurons participating in hundreds of ensembles for all we know. Well, one solution that many of us have come to is that, that uh, it's, it's a neural oscillations, oscill oscillatory dynamics in cortex. We all know about brain waves are, that's what I'll use for shorthand for neural oscillations, and they are an emergent property. They're the synchronized activity of millions of neurons, a large scale organization of neural activity. So what you see here is a crowd doing the wave. Here's the, the wave moving from, uh, from left to right, right? So this is a way, oscillations are a way for a brain to self-organize itself, much like a crowd can do at a stadium. But in the past, when we focused on single neurons and what they do, um, brain waves were dismissed as like being the humming of a car engine. Humming reflects the engine running, but it doesn't make the en engine run. But if you think about it, if a stadium crowd can self-organize with a few simple rules, 
like stand up when the person on my left stands up. Imagine what your brain could do with that principle. And is a large scale organization like you see here, isn't that what's, what's needed for top down executive control? I mean, you know, you can't see these waves on the level of individual neurons. If I pass a microphone around this crowd and, and listen to one voice at a time, you'd hear the person talking and yelling occasionally, but it's only at this higher level of organization where we, we can, where we see all the parts working together, do we see this kind of macro scale, meso, meso macro scale organization. And that's exactly the kind of organization you need for top down executive control. Because it requires getting large bits of your cortex on the same page, coordinated and directed towards the task at hand. And also there's something called representational drift. Neurons are extremely fickle. They come and go. You know, if you, if you record from 100 neurons or 1,000 neurons or a million neurons and you repeat the exact same condition 10, 20, a million times in a row, theoretically, um, you would get the, a different pattern of neurons every single time. Right, because think of the um, individual neurons, the brain as being like the world's largest orchestra. And the neurons are individual players. Well, the orchestra is playing this melody, but the individual players come and go. They walk in, they walk out, they join the song, they, they leave the song. So you know, how do you organize the brain? How do you produce the kind of macro scale organization you need for top down control on the level of individual players? You can't do it, it needs to be on the level of this, this higher organization. And we, we uh, Vici Spinozis uh, recently uh, published a paper um, showing that you could actually, not, not, um, I talked about um, spikes in LFPs, well, now we're looking at the level of electrical fields, not electrical fields like five feet outside your brain, but electrical fields, the combined activity of spikes and LFPs that produce near electric fields that hover near your brain's you know, connections, uh, near, near all your uh, Stomas and dendrites and stuff. And we found that you can read the contents of working memory, not from the, just from the LFPs, but all the way up to at the electric field level. And what's cool about this is that there's little or no representational drift. In this case, at this level, you're actually hearing the song play and you're not getting the representational drift of individual players coming and going. Doesn't that sound like a useful level for organizing brain activity? And isn't it easier to control a stable representation than one that's fickle and the individual players are coming and going? How do you organize that kind of activity at the level of individual neurons? At the very least, you would need a, you know, a gazillion gates on a gazillion um, uh, synapses, never mind the, uh, the problem with this representational drift. So the way to think about this, we think, is um, you organize networks by brainwaves. Neurons that hum together temporarily wired together. And what this means is brain anatomy is not destiny. Brain anatomy is not destiny, it's possibility. Think of brain anatomy as more like the road and highway system. It's the infrastructure. It says with the traffic, the neural signals and spikes where they could go. But your thoughts moment to moment are where the traffic actually is flowing from moment to moment. And that's what we think these brainwave patterns do. These patterns of resonance direct the traffic on the infrastructure of your, of your brain. Is there evidence for this? Yes, Pl now plenty. Um, here's an example of a study by Tim Bushman when he was in my lab. Tim's now a professor at, at Princeton. And he had, he had the animal switch back and forth between, between two different rules. The animal had the view of vertical or a horizontal bar. And the animal either had to tell us what color the bar was or what its orientation was. And we cued the animal randomly to switch back and forth between these two rules. And what's shown here is the lateral prefrontal cortex. This is anterior, posterior, uh, ventral, and dorsal, the principal sulcus for you uh, non-human primate fans. And each of these um, circles is a recording site. And what the lines connect is where we saw significant increases in LFP synchrony when the animal was following the color rule versus the orientation rule. Five minutes Interestingly, left. We looked across all frequencies. We found this exclusively in the beta band. But what you see is what we predict from this mixed selectivity oscillatory model, where we see different patterns, different networks for one rule versus the other, all based on these synchronized LFP dynamics. We were finding that different brainwave frequencies carry different types of information. The spikes that carry bottom-up sensory signals from the back of the brain to your front of the brain, they use um, 
they ride on, on, on gamma, high, high frequency gamma oscillations. But the low frequency top-down executive control signals that filter and regulate sensory processing, they r r um, ride from the front of the brain to the back of the brain on these lower frequency alpha beta oscillations. And we think this imbalance could explain things like the sensory overload seen in autism. And we're actually working on methods and new technology and important techniques and, and to rebalance them. And finally, the last thing I'll say is that the, these, these oscillations can be actually produce very precise effects in cortex. So here's an example. But they, don't, they don't stand still like a standing wave, like a jump rope. They travel and move around cortex. And here's an example of one, one of these waves moving. We found they're not just these waves just don't bounce around cortex randomly. They actually travel in very specific patterns, and they have specific uh, paths. And they even change direction with different cognitive demands. Now, traveling waves are super useful because they buffer information about time and recent network activity, what the brain needs to do computation. If you take a video of a pond and I drop four pebbles in the pond one at a time, I could take a still photograph of, of that video and you could tell me how many pebbles have dropped, where they dropped, and how long ago they dropped. And that's what traveling waves bring to the brain. So in sum, there's been a paradigm shift in our understanding of the brain. The brain is up clockwork, neural activity, underlying cognition is complex, dynamic, and rhythmic, and emergent properties like brainwaves organize brain activity and play key roles in cognition and consciousness. Thank you.